Right, so we've covered what development encompasses, and we've realised that an increase in incomes is only part of what development actually means, according to Sen and Tadaro. We know that actually development encompasses far more. So let's now tackle a very important topic in development economics, which is the relationship between growth and development. A key thing for you to take away is that growth does not equal development. Just because there is high GDP growth, it doesn't necessarily mean that an economy is developing based on what we defined development to be in the previous video. So what we're going to do here is look at why growth is beneficial for development. We'll then look at the limitations of growth and then we'll come to this final conclusion down below that growth is necessary but it's not a sufficient condition for economic development to be achieved. So first of all, why is growth good for development? Well, obviously, an increase in growth is going to mean higher incomes for those within that country. And with higher incomes, that implies that maybe jobs have been created. That implies that the quality of life of people may well improve as they're able to buy more goods and services. Their material standard of living has improved, just as Tadaro said was a key factor in achieving development. And what you'll notice here, when I talk through these benefits and limitations, I'm always coming back to development outcomes that Sen and Tadara have mentioned. And if you do this in an essay, instead of just stopping at higher incomes, then you will score the higher marks. So make sure you do this. The bits in black down the side are very, very important. Higher incomes can also reduce income inequality in the country, which is very important. It also promotes a reduction in poverty. So all these things are very important in, in achieving development outcomes, and they all come about through higher incomes basically a higher GDP per capita, which we can imply will happen when growth increases. Firms, we can also imply, will make higher profits, uh, their confidence will improve, they're more willing to hire people, they're going to be able to make greater sales as incomes in the economy grow, uh, grow. In that sense, their profits may well increase, and if firms use those profits to reinvest in the economy or reinvest back into their own firm, they can advance technology. And an advancement in technology can actually mean that um, the dualistic economic structures in the economy can well disappear. We can move away from agriculture-based production in the economy towards more service-based uh, production or more manufacturing-based production. And that requires an improvement in technology. So if firms are making higher profits, they can invest those and develop this technology to break away from the dualism to move towards more sustainable approaches to growth, towards more inclusive types of production, such as manufacturing and service sector uh, creation, job creation. At the same time, with more profits being made and more investment taking place, we can well see firms actually increasing the number of jobs out there in the economy, needing more people to produce goods and services to satisfy higher demand in the economy. So high job creation, again, is great for development. At the same time, growth can also produce what we call a fiscal dividend, uh, a very nice uh, kind of term for you to use in your essay, and this is big. If there is growth in the economy, we can presume that there will be higher income tax collection. We can presume with higher profits, there will be higher corporation tax collection. We can also assume that um, expenditure taxes like VAT, the revenue collected from those, will also increase, all creating a fiscal dividend, basically higher fiscal revenues for the government. And if the government is efficient, if their motives are pure, then they're going to spend this money on areas that promote development, such as healthcare, such as education, such as infrastructure like roads, like bridges, like sanitation, like telecommunications. All these key bits of infrastructure that actually promote development out there in the economy. So whenever you talk about fiscal dividend, whenever you talk about revenues increasing for the government, you must come to these three fundamental pillars of development, health, education, infrastructure, all massive drivers of development. However, however, there are major limitations of growth. Um, growth is not all-encompassing, and like I've said, growth does not always necessarily equal development. Why? Well, number one, there is no guarantee that growth is going to be equally distributed in the economy. Um, incomes, in that sense, may well differ. There might be a lot of people in the economy with very high incomes and lots of people in the economy with much lower incomes, in which case the standard of living has not increased for all. There is no equality in standard of living. There is no equality in how people are in terms of well-being, in which case that's not achieving economic development. You just have to look at major advanced economies, in fact. Look at the UK. 
Look at the USA. At the moment, we would argue that they are very unequal when it comes to income distribution. Even though GDP is increasing at the moment, people would argue that they're not feeling that increase in wealth. It's not being distributed equally. And even in less uh, advanced economies, in your African economies, in, in places like India and China, we can argue that income inequality is a major issue that's actually hindering development. So although growth is increasing, and especially in China increasing very rapidly, we can argue that maybe economic development is not increasing at the same pace because of income inequality. Number two is a very important point. With growth in developing countries, often uh, what comes about as well are major negative externalities like pollution, like resource depletion, like resource degradation. In the short term, if we exploit all of our natural resources, if we uh, extract them all from the ground and we export them, we produce lots of them, we sell them, that's great in the short term, that's going to lead to growth. But in the long term, if we deplete all of our resources, where does our growth come from? It's not sustainable. At the same time, if what we are extracting and what we're producing is polluting the environment, it's leading to a loss of maybe biodiversity, or it's actually reducing health in the economy because people have to inhale toxic smoke or something, that's going to reduce people's well-being in the economy. That's not improving people's living standards in the economy, in which case that's a drag on development. Even though it may lead to growth, it's not actually leading to development. And GDP on its own doesn't tell us that. It just tells us how much we're producing, not whether what we're producing is actually harming the economy as well, or harming individuals as well. And number three, where is growth actually taking place? If growth is taking place in one dominant sector, again, there is no guarantee that that's going to benefit the whole of society, the whole economy. A great example of this is Nigeria. Nigeria is an economy that's very oil dependent. It's got a huge oil sector. And in fact, that's what drives the economy. But as a result of growth from the oil sector in Nigeria, there is no guarantee, in fact, it doesn't happen that incomes in that sector are distributed to the rest of the economy. It's just those who are involved in the oil sector that benefit uh, from the increase in growth from oil, or from the oil sector. In which case we can argue that growth in one dominant sector is not necessarily going to lead to development in the rest of the economy or for the rest of society. So that's another point worth considering as a limitation to growth on its own. Therefore we can see that growth in the right areas is beneficial. If growth takes place, which actually generates a fiscal dividend, which is then redistributed in the rest of the economy in these three pillars, then great. If growth is, being, uh, if, if growth is leading to higher incomes, which is benefiting the whole of the economy and everyone in society, then great. That's fine. So inclusive growth is great. However, if growth is not inclusive, if, our, if there are these limitations, then growth on its own may not lead to development. So therefore, we must finish with this key conclusion that growth is important. We can't get development without growth. However, on its own, it's not the only sufficient condition that leads to development. There are lots of other things that need to happen as well. There needs to be strong government. There need to be firms that have the incentives to reinvest. There needs to be a way of redistributing income throughout the economy, etc., etc. And if these aren't taking place, then growth may not lead to development. And that's a key thing to take away. Growth is a necessary condition, yes, but it's not sufficient in achieving development. Bear that in mind as you write a very important essay on this crucial relationship in economics. Thanks very much for watching. See you all next time.